So this right here is the location of the first ever innocent victim of the 1991 Colombo War. There's a really gruesome crime scene photo that you're gonna have to go on Instagram to see the uncensored version of. Okay everybody, this is Mooney Dashcam. Tonight we are in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. We're gonna be talking about the first innocent victim of the most recent Colombo War. I'm gonna be going over in detail exactly what led up to this happening and we're gonna go to exactly where it happened. So let's flip this around and get into it. This incident happened in December of 1991. The address that we're going to is 8905 Third Avenue, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, like I mentioned before. The place was called Wana Bagel. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, at Mooney-Cam. I post in there pretty much every single day. Any crime scene photos that can't go on YouTube end up on the Instagram, so go check that out. Also, don't forget to leave suggestions for future videos in the comments. I very much appreciate that. I get a lot of inspiration that way. And lastly, hit the notification bell so you guys can see exactly when I post a new video. Okay. It's early on a Sunday morning. 18-year-old Mateo Speranza gets up to cover his co-worker's shift that he agreed to cover last minute, probably trying to prove his work ethic or make a few extra bucks, who knows. He got the job because his mother knew the owner and she asked him for a favor. He worked there while also being a student. He was the only one opening and working that morning while he was there. Just to give some context to this video, I'm gonna clip in a brief description from a previous video of the full reasoning how the Colombo War started. It's interesting enough and it adds good enough context to make this all make sense. The Colombo War started by Carmine the Snake Persico, the Colombo boss, getting sentenced to 100 years in 1987. Pretty much, you know, a death sentence. He was sentenced to 100 years. And his son, little Alley Boy, got 12 years. Now trying to maintain power, Carmine appoints his brother, Alley Boy, as the acting boss. But then Alley Boy gets arrested for loan sharking and he disappears. So he can't rely on that anymore. So Carmine puts together a committee of three people, one of those people being Vic Arena. So those three guys run all the decisions, pretty much acting as the boss between the three of them. And they were supposed to do that until little Alley Boy got out of prison. Then Vic Arena ended up kind of stepping up and he was actually named captain during this time and he was making millions and millions of dollars for Carmine Persico. So Carmine recognized that. Now Carmine's doing all this in prison. I'm gonna put a picture of him in prison. So he actually looks pretty funny when he's not in a suit. He's an odd looking guy to begin with, but he looks even crazier when he's not in a suit. So, then in 1988, Carmine gets rid of the committee and makes Vic Arena the sole acting boss. And he doesn't just make him a regular acting boss. This was very rare that he gave him the ability to induct new members into the Colombo family. An unusual amount of power for an acting boss. But then Vic Arena got tired of taking orders from Carmine and he enjoyed being the boss and he didn't want to give it over to Little Alley Boy when he got out of prison. So he started making moves to become the boss. Arena tells a guy to get votes between everyone in the family of who they want to be boss, Arena or Persico. And that guy was loyal to Persico, so instead of doing that, because he knew if he did do it, Persico would have him killed. So he went straight to Persico in prison, Carmine Persico, and told him exactly what Arena was doing so then Carmine Persico has a hit crew sent to Vic Arena's house on June 20th, 1991. But Vic spotted them and he took off. And that's what kicked off the war between the Persico faction and the Arena faction. Also, I'm gonna link in the description the video that leads up to this video, the incidents that lead up to this. Uh, it's one of my more recent videos of Greg Scarpa killing Vincent Fasaro outside of his house. Continuing on. On December 6, 1991, Christopher Liberatore and Louis Bobo Malpeso are celebrating their birthday 
at a place called Cafe on N. It's a Colombo Arena Faction hangout. I'm assuming on Avenue N. I'm not sure, I couldn't find the exact address of the place, but that would make the most sense. They're hanging out celebrating, and the whole place hears about Greg Scarpa killing the arena loyalist Vincent Fossaro. In response to that, Louis Malpeso and Joseph Amato come up with a plan to kill Persico loyalist and big earners Frank, Big Frank Guerrero. And Anthony Ferraro. I don't exactly know how they picked these two to kill. You would think since Greg Scarpa was the one who killed Vinny that they would go after Greg Scarpa. But I believe they already tried to kill Greg Scarpa and that didn't work out for them. So I guess they're going with these guys. So bright and early on December 8th, a team is put together. It's Louis Malpeso, Joe Amato, Christopher Liberatore, who is an associate assigned to follow Mel Peso's orders, and then his father, Anthony Liberatore, and 24-year-old Tommy Kappa. Their mission is to find and kill Anthony and Frank. Louis Mel Peso is in a safe car. He has no weapons on him. That's to slow the police. If anyone chases, he could get in front of them and hit the brakes or do some maneuver and get pulled over and he'll be like the cover to have the other guys get away. The Liberatores are in a car together. Chris, the son, is the shooter. Joe Amato and Tommy Kappa are together in Amato's car. Malpeso is the only one without a gun in this situation. They drove to Anthony and Frank's homes. No one was at the homes, which is pretty typical during this war. Everyone either stayed out at a fancy hotel, hid out in a safe house, all bundled together. Uh, they just weren't at their regular addresses because it was too easy to kill them there. They also went to a bagel shop that they owned together called Wanna Bagel. Someone was in there, but they determined that it was not Frank or Anthony. So they go back to Frank's house and they wait to see if there's any action, any movement, if he's coming by to stop by, or whatever the case. They're just staking it out. They kind of ran out of their lead that they had. Now, while they're waiting, a black Lincoln keeps passing them. Now, they're fearing it could be an enemy from the Persico faction. So they stay on the safe side and they leave. But the Lincoln starts following them. So, Chris Liberatore got into Louis Malpeso's car just in case there was a gunfight because like I said, Louis did not have a gun of his own on him. I'm letting this guy go and he's not understanding. There we go, no problem. And then he looks at me like he's mad. The Lincoln eventually stops following them, but now they're interested in why this Lincoln may have been following them, so they start following the Lincoln. It pulls into a driveway, so Louis Malpeso pulls in the driveway also and orders Chris and Joe Amato to shoot, but they both don't shoot, which is like big against the rules. But I think since Joe Amato also denied the order and he was a little higher up, it kind of gave Chris a little bit of leeway to do the same. So they were both in that driveway and there was kind of like an awkward standoff and then they both pulled off and they separated ways. As this is going on, at 9 a.m., Lewis's son, 21-year-old James Malpeso, a low-level loan shark, just got dropped off at Coney Island Hospital with a gunshot to his chest. He will not talk to the police, and his father has no idea what happened yet. So, Chris and Louis Malpeso go back to Louis's place, and then he gets a call about his son, the situation that he's in. He's in a fit of rage, of course. He's in this whole situation, about to pull off a murder, and then he gets this crazy call. So he yells at Chris, saying, get the guys in the black Lincoln, go find Anthony and Frank, and go kill the guys at the bagel store. Now, Chris is hesitant to do any of this. He's kind of like a low-level associate, but he survived once today saying no, 
to Lewis, so obviously he did not say no again. So Chris calls his father, Anthony, and they go to Anthony Ferrara's house, Frank Guerrero's house. They go to where they last saw that black Lincoln, and they finally go to Wannabeagle, their final destination for all the leads that they have. We are very close to this place. There should be a bus stop up here for me to stop in, and then we'll hop out and show it. Should we check? Yeah, of course we should check. All right, so you can imagine this was the block that Chris and his father pull up on, knowing that they have to go into this bagel store, and who knows exactly what they're gonna do here. I'm happy this place closed because it was a, a hair salon and there were a bunch of women in here, and I didn't want to make anybody nervous by filming. So this is 8905 Third Avenue. Bay Ridge, the former location of Wannabagel, and you can imagine right here is where they were parked. Hey, you wonder why I'm filming? There was a there was a mob murder here a while ago. Yeah, this location. That's all. Yeah, ninety one. What? Nineteen ninety one. Yeah. Right here, right right in this place. Yeah. Crazy. <clears throat> Myself, I got a YouTube channel. What's that? Uh, Mooney Dash Cam. Yeah. Take care, have a good one. They wait outside until the customers leave. And they go in and Chris walks up and starts interrogating the kid behind the counter, 18 year old. Matteo Speranza and he says do you know where the owners are he doesn't really answer right away he doesn't really want to answer and then he asks Chris why he was asking and then Chris in a testimony later on said he thought that Matteo was grabbing under the counter for a gun so Chris then shoots Matteo six times in the face head and body so this right here is the location of the first ever innocent victim of the 1991 colombo war mateo Sperenza. there's a really gruesome crime scene photo that you're gonna have to go on instagram to see the uncensored version of i'll put the censored version up here This is the street this went down at. Irish, for, I guess St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day is soon, right? Okay, let's get back in the truck. We'll finish off this video. We'll say hi to the truck, of course. As dirty as ever. You guys want to see some real dirt on the truck? Sperenza died that morning at 8.05 a.m. at Lutheran Hospital. It's a horrible situation because his mother gets him a job thinking she's being a good mother, which she was being a good mother, of course, and this kid ends up wrapped in this horrible situation. I mean, he ends up dead over it. It's really, really terrible. The war was so crazy at that time, he was actually the fourth person to be killed within six days of this incident. They only realized what they did the next day when the paper came out. They realized how young he was and how he had no involvement in anything criminal at all. He was just a student making some money, just having a regular job like everyone's supposed to do. They ended up ditching the car in Canarsie, Brooklyn. They wiped it clean of their fingerprints. They ripped out the ignition and they left it and they called it and they had one of their wives call it and stolen. And that was the end of that. Then you could say, oh, what? It was involved in a murder? All right, it was stolen. I don't know what to tell you. Then in April 1995, Chris Liberatore 
cooperated. That's pretty much how we know all this information. And then soon after that, his father, Anthony, cooperated as well. So I guess you could thank them for being rats so we know this story. Many of you may be pleased to know that James Malpeso, Louis's son, did not die. He survived getting shot in the chest. He didn't kick his ways of being a loan shark. He was a low-level loan shark back then, but in 2011, he was arrested for threatening somebody that he loaned money to. He loaned the guy like 200 grand, and then uh, it was at a 5% return weekly, which I think I read in the article was 260% a year on that money, which is insane. So the guy ended up wearing a wire and talking with him in a car and had like a 90 minute conversation and they get pulled out of gun. The whole thing, he went to jail for that. So that happened in 2011. He was alive and well that time. I don't know his current situation, if he's in jail or not, but I believe that's pretty much everything I have to tell you about the situation. Thank you for watching. I very much appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next one.